We were lucky enough to sit down and have a conversation with a widely celebrated storyteller, Matthew Dix. Matthew Dix is an extraordinary storyteller and has also led an extraordinary life. Matt has died and been revived not once, but twice in his life. Matt was wrongfully imprisoned for a crime he did not commit and ultimately exonerated. And in an event that shaped a lot of his life and work, Matt was held up at gunpoint when he was a manager of a local McDonald's in his 20s. Since then, Matt has gone on to be an internationally best-selling author, a widely acclaimed Trained, awarded, celebrated storyteller, and is also a storytelling and marketing consultant for companies and organizations like Slack and Amazon. He's also guest lectured on storytelling at institutions like Harvard, Yale, and MIT. Matt is also an elementary school teacher, father of two, husband of one, but Matt brings a very important message to anyone he's talking to about storytelling. And the message is this, no one needs to experience the kind of trauma or the kind of success that he's experienced in order to find and tell great stories. And in this conversation, we dig into the art of finding our stories and using the craft of storytelling to communicate them in the best possible way. I hope you enjoyed the conversation as much as we did. It seems as if in your life as a storyteller, Matt, there was kind of like life before you stepped onto a stage to tell your own stories and then kind of the life and all the work that has grown out of your live storytelling from personal narrative. And I love how when you talk about that first time that the story kind of involves you being extremely reluctant to even get on that stage the first time. And I'm interested, what has changed for you in your in your life and storytelling and the way that you live with stories from that moment of stepping onto a stage and telling your own stories from your own life? Yeah, that's interesting because I never thought of it that way, but you're right, there is that that defining moment in July of 2011, when I take a stage for the first time and and tell a story. You know, I I think what I'd say is before I took that stage, I was very much a storyteller and all my friends thought I was, which is what sent them, made made me go to New York in the first place. They sent me there. But I think prior to taking the stage, I wasn't a storyteller with intentionality. I was sort of doing the work but not recognizing the work for what it was. I was writing novels already and telling stories on the page but they recognized me as someone who was a person who could tell a good story and entertain an, a you know a group of people in a car or at a party or you know on the golf course places like that but once i sort of took that stage and told that first story every a switch sort of happened where i thought wow this is a thing and i love standing right here and sharing my life in a vulnerable and amusing way to people and so from that point on i started looking at what i was doing with purpose. So, you know, it was really interesting to discover, oh, here's a strategy that I use, you know, that I was sort of unaware that I was using and I was using 80% of the time, but suddenly I was using it 100% of the time, you know, or here's a thing that I, I, I inherently have done all my life, except not with the consistency that would perhaps yield better results. And so, you know, as I teach storytelling, the first thing I did was had to deconstruct my own process and understand what I was doing and why I was doing it. And then teach that to people and then start paying attention to new and interesting ways to continue that education. So I I think it's the intentionality that took place that night that really has shifted everything for me. Mm. And do you feel like um, in kind of taking an intentional approach to the sort of um, performative aspect of telling your own stories, I'm just curious what um what value you find in that <laughs> that's different even from like fiction writing right and and it's interesting because i think there's such an impulse for songwriters to really tell their own stories and it's interesting sometimes i actually have to prod students to step outside their own autobiographical fact and also kind of embrace the idea that um you know their own autobiographical fact as as writers um particularly as songwriters and it's different I think to what you do when you're telling your real stories but it it can be kind of bent a little bit you know and sometimes we kind of need to shave away some of the factual or autobiographical truth to actually get to a more like emotional truth um in song and I kind of have to prod them away from like thinking of themselves as like investigative journalists who are who are like bound to the autobiographical fact of their life um and I'm interested to hear you know what what you feel is the difference between the kind of truth that comes out of personal narrative versus the kind of truth that you can get out through like fiction or or 
imaginative storytelling. Sure. I guess when I write fiction, it's invention, you know, and although it's invention drawing on my life or my observations, my experiences, and, you know, if you know me well, you read a novel, you go, oh, well, I know what that is. And, you know, I can see how he took a moment in his life and heightened it for the purpose of the of the book. But it's very inventive. And I sort of don't have an ending in mind. I always start with a question for my novels, a what if question, you know, what if the world was like this, and then I just write, and I find my way, I always describe it as I'm kind of reading the book, while I'm writing the book. So I have cried at the end of more than one novel while writing it, because I am overcome by the moment that I did not see coming, even though that sounds ridiculous, because I created it. And yet somehow, you know, I didn't create it, it was sort of sitting there. And I just was the scribe to what already existed, which I'm not a spiritual religious person in any way. So for me to even hear myself say that is ridiculous. But that's my honest experience when I'm writing a novel, I've gasped out loud surprised by the sentence I just wrote, the sort of moment in the story when I went, oh my gosh, I can't believe that this just happened. You know, and my my kids have heard me gasp while I'm writing fiction. And they, they my son's like, how can you be surprised? You, you wrote it. And I said, I know, but at the moment I wrote it, it was like I was reading it. And so those two things are sort of aligned for me. Whereas when I stand on a stage and tell a story about myself or I write about myself, I think of it as a puzzle, which is to say I'm saddled with facts. I cannot change the facts in any way. Really, all I can do is I can eliminate facts that are not useful to the story. And really, that is not useful. It's not that I'm eliminating them because it's useful to me. It's useful to the audience. So a fact that actually might make me look great, but is not great for the story will go away. So I'm always thinking of the audience in that regard. So I can eliminate things, but otherwise, it's a puzzle box where I have to organize the information in such a way and find a way to say it in such a way that it brings the audience to the moment, sort of my catharsis, my five second moment, my moment of transformation, I want them to be as close to me as possible when that happens, I want them to understand me with full and complete, you know, wholesome, I'm in your head, and I get it. And maybe I even feel the same thing you felt while you describe it. So that's the difference really is it's invention versus a puzzle. And I love both. I, I adore both. I love the surprise and you know, so the whimsical nature of writing fiction, but I really love the idea of here's some facts and I got to deal with these facts. And I also love the idea that when I'm personally storytelling, I really am sort of taking a lens to my life in a really serious way and finding things out about myself that I didn't understand or hadn't really put to words in a way that made sense to me. And so, so often when I'm telling a story or when I'm getting ready to tell a story, I find something about my life that I sort of didn't understand. And suddenly that becomes the most important part of the story. Matt, how do you feel about the idea of memory or remembering an event as opposed to the facts? Because you just sort of said there the facts are unchangeable or you're saddled with the facts. But we know that our memory of an event, especially if it's been a little while, you know, it changes the event. And you talk to someone who was also maybe there 20 years ago and they say, oh, that's not how I remember it. Like, how do you how do you approach that or even use that in your storytelling? I always just accept the fact that what I remember is my truth. And it may not be the truth, but it is how I recall it. Very famously, my wife and I, the night that our daughter was conceived, my wife burned her hand on a frying pan that had been in the oven. She took it out and forgot that it had been hot. So she grabbed it really bad burns on her hand. And at the time, the story is about how I kind of don't want to be a father yet, because I don't think I'm going to be very good at it, because I didn't have a father myself. And so when she burns her hand, I actually think I have a one month reprieve, because she's ovulating, she wants to make a baby tonight, but now she's burned her hand so badly that there's no way we're going to fool around. And ultimately, she comes to the bedroom with ice wrapped around her hand and just says, like, make it quick, which I was perfectly capable of doing. But when I'm getting that story ready, I'm telling the story out loud, because that's how I craft my stories. I sort of walk around the house and talk to myself. She hears it in, in the story that I'm getting ready to tell, I burned my hand. And she goes, you didn't burn your hand that night, I burned my hand. And I said, no, I think I burned my hand. And then you made me put ice on. She's like, you're crazy. And thankfully, because I've written a blog post every single day for the last 20 years, I had a record of the day, we went back to the day and she was correct. So you're right in that memory is entirely fallible. But as a storyteller, I can only report on what I accurately, in my mind, remember happening. And that's 
that's what people want. They want the honest to God truth from the person who remembers it. And occasionally people will correct me. And, and when they correct me, obviously I corrected that story and I made my wife the, the ice bound hero who comes to bed. And sometimes I'll be on a stage and people will say, you know, you forgot the best part. And sometimes I do forget the best part. I'm like, my God, I can't believe I didn't say that, you know? And a lot of times people will say, but I was there that night too. You didn't even mention me. And I'll say, well, you didn't do anything. You just clouded the scene. Like I didn't need you there because you were irrelevant. And so for that reason, I plucked you out of the story. But most of the time, I like to think I'm accurate. And when I'm not, I'm at least being honest about what I think is accurate. I'm picturing your friends as like, you know, those extras that are always trying to get into the side of the shot, you know? Well, <laughs> it's the opposite usually. They're, they're usually going, this is not story worthy. You may not speak of this moment right now. It's more, please don't tell this on the stage. I don't need this in my life right now. But occasionally it's true. Yeah, I have one guy in my life who says like, you never told a story about me before. And I said, well, I'm still waiting for you to do something memorable. So. <laughs> um. Matt, even as you were recalling that story, you know, you were talking about the fact that you're like, your wife burnt her hand, but this is really a story actually about your desire not to be a father at that particular moment. Um, and it kind of brings me to a question that I wanted to ask you that I think really resonates again with, with songwriters in particular, early stage songwriters who a lot of the time struggle to find what to write about or inversely don't struggle to find what to write about but are just writing about the same thing over and over and over again and you know I, I i wanted to hear you talk about that challenge for people in the early stages of identifying what aspects of their life are worthy of turning into stories or story worthy and also sort of what advice would you give to people who feel like they don't have experiences worthy of song or story or a kind of just like fixated on one thing that that's like the only story they can tell because that's the one either thematic thing that they believe is the only thing worthy of telling a story about or is like the only like exciting thing that has ever happened to them or dramatic or traumatic thing that has ever happened to them well you know that's all crazy talk you know i tell people when they say they don't have a lot of stories to tell i i say you're really not that special you know, everyone thinks they're a unicorn that doesn't have any stories. And I say, none of you are unicorns. You're just boring horses and you're just not opening your eyes. So everyone has stories to tell. We sort of walk by them in life, which is the tragedy. You know, we, if we're not storytellers and we're not doing the things that I teach to actively seek out story, so often we just fail to ever take notice of it. Last night, I was on a call with a client. I was actually helping her. She's a business client, but in this particular case, she has a wedding coming up, her, her son's wedding, and she was preparing a, a speech. And she was telling me how wonderful I had done. And I really had sort of taken nothing and spun it into gold for her and helped her do a good job. And she said something really lovely, like, you're brilliant. And I yelled to my wife. I said, honey, Karen just told me I'm brilliant. And she said, that's great. And I said to Karen, I said, you know, it's weird because... When people say nice things about me, it's irrelevant if my wife doesn't hear it. And I said to myself, well, there's something, right? Now, it's not a story yet, but there is something, right? And so that's in my homework for life right away. And as a storyteller, what I do is I don't allow that moment to get by me, right? I, most people do. Even if they recognize it's a moment, by the next day, it's gone. Most people, that's how we live, right? If I ask you to, what you did last Thursday, if you're not a storyteller, you're not actively doing the things I'm suggesting to find stories most people have forgot last thursday already it's gone forever so i don't let the moment go by and then i'm going to puzzle it i might puzzle it for a week a month i might puzzle it for five years i might continually come back to that moment and say why is it more important for my wife to hear the good things said about me than it is for me now that's a song also frankly right i can already tell that that would be a song Right? I can kind of already hear the chorus to that song. And I'm not a songwriter. I've written a couple of musicals in a rock opera, but really all I did was sort of order songs, like like you ordered me at a deli, and my songwriter, my lyricist, wrote the whole song. He's really brilliant at that. But I know that would be a song. As a storyteller, I gotta do a lot more work because I can't get away with a chorus. I gotta I gotta find all the stuff that has led to the moment that caused me to have that realization. It was a five second moment for me, a moment of sort of transformation and understanding about myself. So it doesn't take much. You know, I think the mistake people make is they think stories have um, have action 
and stuff happens. And what I tell people is almost all of my stories, with very few exceptions, if you were watching me at that singular moment of transformation, the most important moment I experience in the story, if you were watching me, you would never know I was having a moment. Because oftentimes I'm sitting at a desk and I suddenly realize, whoa, that's a thing. If you were my neighbor looking in the window, you'd never know. I just had an enormous realization about my life. And so I think people are always looking for the stuff we do when most stories happen inside our heads. And most of a story is just the prologue to get people into our heads with as much context as needed to make the stuff that's happening in our head make sense to them too. So you just have to like pay attention. I always say, if it means something to you, you can make it mean something to other people. So if you just feel it, that that feeling, you can make other people feel it too if you use enough craft and enough time and you know, you're clever enough. Can we drill down on something you just said, Matt, which was this idea that you said it out loud to your wife. You got the compliment. You said it outside your wife. Uh, you said it out loud to your wife, which in itself is like a funny little moment. We can almost see that as a scene. You're kind of creating a little a little film scene for us. And if you wanted to, you could have left it there, and sort of said, "Oh, that's a funny little thing that you know I turned and did that." the The transformation feels like, or where you go, the extra step is that you're looking for an insight. You're you're interrogating the moment. And, and going, oh, that's interesting that I'm seeking that that validation. That could be something. And so there are layers to this, right? You're, you're sort of basically saying that stories can be anything. And I'm fascinated by this idea that you are essentially taking the most almost unnoteworthy parts of a day and turning them into something interesting because of that insight. But it requires that you're investigating. It requires that you're you're looking at it and reflecting on it and then noting it down and then giving it time if, if, if time is what is required. Can we just talk a little bit more about that iterative process that you have really turned into a habit? Yeah, I always say that storytellers are deeply curious about themselves. And I think storytellers are some of the few people in the world who actually afford themselves the opportunity to think about themselves in a somewhat selfish way. It's very rare in this world that you're not sort of thinking about your neighbor, your spouse, your children, you know, your career, your boss, your colleagues, it's rare to say to yourself, I'm just going to think about myself for a while. I'm going to think about my day. I'm going to think about the moments I've experienced. And I'm going to puzzle things and, and pull on threads and ask myself tricky questions like, why is that true? Why is, why is that thing happening to me? You know, my favorite example is, and, and sort of like one of the most profound examples for me was I was playing golf with my friend Steve a few years ago, and it was like 110 degrees. And I left my Gatorade in the car. And so we were on like the sixth hole. We were trudging up a hill and I was dying. And Steve said, hey, I have a couple extra Gatorades. Do you need one? And I said, no, I'm fine, which was crazy because it was over 100 degrees and I was dying. And I heard myself say no. And I said to myself, why did you just say no? That's crazy. The round of golf finished. I got in my car. Steve drove away and I stayed in my car. And I said to myself, why did you say no to that Gatorade? Because you needed it and he had three. That's crazy. And I sat in my car in the air conditioning for five minutes. And I thought about how I live my life and I pulled on some strings and I realized, oh, when I was a kid, I was hungry all the time. We didn't have enough to eat. And when you're a kid and you don't have enough food to eat, the last thing you ever want anyone to know is that you don't have enough food to eat. The shame is worse than the hunger. And so as a kid, I had trained myself to always refuse the offer of food because to accept it acknowledged hunger. And I also knew I could never reciprocate because I was never a kid walking around with more food than he needed. And so for my entire life, when people had offered me food, I had always declined and it had just become a habit. So I was a 45 year old man with a 10 year old living inside him, still refusing the offer of food when I have more food than I ever could use now. And all of that happened because I gave myself five minutes in my car to say, why did you do that thing that you did? And I think most people drive home and that moment's lost forever and they don't find that insight. And that becomes a story that people love and they cry at the end of it, but it disappears completely to me if I don't find curiosity in the way that I live. Because I think a lot of the things that we do in our lives, unless we interrogate them, unless we say, why do we do the things that we do? That's a question I ask myself all the time. Why do you do the thing that you do? 
if we don't interrogate ourselves, we don't understand ourselves. And if we don't understand ourselves, we don't have stories to tell. So we really have to be deeply curious about who we are as people and afford ourselves that opportunity. And the number one way I can get people to cry, especially women, in my workshops is by telling them, I'm giving you permission to stop thinking about everything else in the world except yourself because you deserve some time to think about yourself and to stop thinking about everyone else. And people cry in workshops because they recognize that, my God, I'm 48 years old and I've spent my entire life thinking about everyone but me. So the sooner we can get past that and just be a little more self-centered in a positive, productive way, I think that's really helpful. Um, Matt, everything that you just said reminds me of one of the kind of quotes that I had highlighted from Storyworthy, I think it is, and you, you say in Storyworthy, story, storytelling helps you realize the biggest, scariest, most painful or regretful things in your head, and they get smaller and surmountable when you share them with people. And um, I'm actually, you, you know, and you have a beautiful story about uh, that you did not tell for many years because there was so much shame attached to it. And this is the McDonald's stripping story. Um, and then in, in like telling that story, kind of holding that shame. And, and I think to a certain extent, like you talk about <laughs> making sure that it doesn't kind of, the ink doesn't spread into the rest of your life. And um, I'm actually interested to know whether you think that crafting a story for some, for people that you work with, like if someone has a trauma or, or experience of shame or hurt and anger, can telling the story actually help get past it? Or does someone actually need a certain amount of distance to craft the story in a way that will avoid making an audience feel like they are proxy therapists in a like uncomfortable way? Yeah, time is required. You know, we, we say we tell our stories from our scars, not our wounds. So you have to be at a point where you can speak of it in a way that we can now apply craft to it, right? And not just speak from the raw heart. So I say you tell those stories that are still sort of wounds to the people you love in private spaces as often as you need to, you know, and maybe to professionals until you are able to speak to it in a way that applies craft and applies some of the skills that are required to speak to a larger audience. But once that happens, I think there's actually more growth that can be made. You know, lots of the stories that I've had, I've had like this weird, difficult life at times. And so often those weird, difficult times, they sort of are infections in your life. They sort of, they sort of bleed into other parts of your life. And I've discovered that when I tell a story about one of those moments, what I do is I sort of create a chapter and I sort of seal it off. And then when you create a story like that, you bring value to it. You bring value to your pain, you know? So what, what the first time I told my story of being homeless, I can't tell you how many times people come up to me when I tell that story and say, I was homeless for six weeks or six months or for a year. I lived in my car for two years. I've never told anyone in my life because I thought they would all think terribly of me, you know? But when you're willing to do it in front of people, they suddenly recognize, I don't think terribly of him. And he just reported on something that I also experienced, right? And so... You know, telling that story did a lot of things for me, and then it did a lot of things for other people, which makes it almost wonderful that you experienced this difficult thing because now you can you can bring light to other people. I tell it to my students every year because one year I told it to my students and, you know, everyone went out to recess except for one 10-year-old girl who stayed behind and she said her mother and she had lived in the car during the summer and they were in an apartment now, but she worried that if they had to move back into the car, she wouldn't be able to come to school anymore. You know, and I remember that was like around November, which meant for two and a half months, that girl had lived in fear that she might not be able to come back to school if she ends up in a car again. And so we were able to both make sure that family was in a position where that wasn't going to happen. But more importantly, I was able to alleviate fear from a child who really needed to like be with her friends and learn what she needed to learn. And so, you know, when we can get to the point that it's a scar and we can talk about it with craft and with art and all of those things... We can just make it something that we can almost feel happy that happened to us, even some of those terrible things. And you have talked about this idea that, well, writing a story is one thing, or really what we've been talking about is as a storyteller, 
um, you derive great value from actually coming up with the stories and reflecting on the moment and sitting in the car and thinking, why do I do what I do? Or why do I, why do I think that? Which for you is, is hugely valuable. One of the things that seems to happen when you then tell those stories, and you would have experienced this so many times doing the moth, is that you get people responding to the story because you've shared it out loud. You've taken it from an internal place. You've you've shared it externally. And all of a sudden, the people hearing it have permission to reflect on their own journey that could be of a similar nature. And without that sharing, there is no permission. There is There is only this shame that everyone keeps holding on to internally. So I'm really fascinated by this idea of there is obviously the crafting of the story, but then the sharing of the story creates this whole other chain reaction. Yeah. It, it, although I will say to people all the time, the first and most important audience for every story you tell is yourself. And if that's all you ever, that's the only audience that ever hears your story, there's still great value in that. But you're right. The weird thing or the surprising thing we'll say is that oftentimes when I share a moment of vulnerability on stage and people come and talk to me, which happens all the time, oftentimes what they share with me is completely unrelated to what I have just told. But the similarity is its vulnerability. So, you know, just before the pandemic, I told a story about bad parenting, a, a bad parenting decision that I made. And when I stepped off the stage, I was in New York. A woman came up to me and she said, without even introducing herself, she grabbed me because people touch me all the time. There's this weird asymmetrical relationship where they they hold my forearms and they, they hold me tight. It's really, um, it's different. Uh, although I just heard a podcaster talking about this, um, Terry O'Reilly, who does a, a marketing par- podcast. And he says that these upfronts he goes to, he said he discovered as soon as he started podcasting, people started touching him all the time because he's in their heads, right? And if you're doing your dishes and listening to Terry, you feel like he's in your house. And then he reported the same thing. I was so happy it wasn't just me. Anyway, this woman comes up to me. She grabs me. She holds on to me without introducing herself to me. She says, every time I go into someone's house, even my own mother's house, I have to steal something. And then she pulls me really in close and she whisper yells at me. She says, I've never told anyone that before. So this is a 40 something year old woman who's living with legitimate mental illness. And she's gone her entire life without speaking about it to anyone. And then a random man showed up on a stage and told a parenting story completely unrelated to what I was, what she's suffering with. And she said, that's the guy I'm going to talk to. Right. And five times in my life, I'd had a woman come up to me and tell me about her miscarriage. And all five times, I was the one and only person she had ever spoken to about her miscarriage. And I have never told a miscarriage story in my life. It was just, again, one of those moments of he seems like the right person. I think we carry like burdens around in our lives. And when someone sort of puts that burden down in front of you, it's a signal to you that maybe I get to do the same thing. And maybe this is like the the start of that opportunity. And so I get... You just can't imagine how many unexpected, we will say, things that people tell me following a story that I'm I'm both honored that they're willing to share, but also sometimes like just looking to have a good night. And <laughs> I'm sometimes burdened with things that I'm sort of like going home thinking about that I don't necessarily want to be burdened with. But it's an honor. And, you know, obviously I'm always receptive to it. So in terms of value, for anyone listening who doesn't think of themselves as creative or doesn't think of themselves as someone who wants to use storytelling to have a career, it feels like reading your work and listening to your podcasts, um, it feels like there's this whole other element to it, which is really promoting the idea that storytelling and learning how to tell stories and, and learning how to share stories is is a value add for life. It's a value add for finding meaning in your existence, for turning ordinary things into extraordinary things, or even just reflecting with gratitude. It feels like if you had to make the case for anyone learning how to do this, it wouldn't have to be related to a, a career in, in storytelling or, or songwriting or, or being a novelist. No, you could be a hermit in the mountains of Alaska, never wanting to see another human being in your life, And I still think you should be finding and telling stories. And when I say tell, one of the important things about the way the brain works is you have to say them out loud. You know, when we hear ourselves, when we hear the words that we speak, that has an impact on us. That has a profound impact that is different than when we think it. Saying it out loud is so different. So I tell people, even if you never want to tell anyone else, tell yourself and you have to say it out loud. So find a place where you feel safe to actually speak your story out loud to yourself. And it just 
it has profound impacts on you. So yes, I agree. It has nothing to do with standing on a stage and speaking into a microphone or or singing a song. I think it starts with, I want to be a person who understands myself and the way I interact with the world and figure out why I am who I am. One of the things we're talking about, though, that occurs to me is, you know, and, and I think about this all the time with songwriting and, and teaching other people how to write songs, is there is the experience of the storyteller and then there's the experience of the audience and while we may not ever need to stand on a stage that the thing that happens when we do and kind of enter that sharing space like like the the conjoining factor there that you were referencing before is is actually like craft and one of the ways that i talk to my songwriting students about this is to say you know there's a kind of songwriting that is catharsis and then there's songwriting that is communication you know and there's a venn diagram in which those two things are not mutually exclusive but there's a different intentionality behind them and we might make certain decisions that are different if we start to be concerned with communication and not merely catharsis and that's where the conversation about craft actually comes in and one of the things that I find fascinating, Matt, is and I don't know if you've experienced this in, in your world in kind of just storytelling in, in songwriting, there is a lot of resistance to craft. Like people get really angry when you talk about the idea that there are certain tools, techniques, methods, strategies, processes that you can employ to actually make your songs better, to make them communicate more effectively to other people. And I'm just interested um, well, I'm interested in lots of things. I'm firstly interested in, in like how you discovered the craft of storytelling and what the impact of applying craft to storytelling has been for you and people that you work with. And I have lots of other questions about this concept, but why don't we start there? Well, let me start with the second part, which is, you know, what you called communication, I, I always say is... The first job of every storyteller, regardless of what your purpose on stage is, is to be entertaining. Because if people are unwilling to listen to you, what you say is irrelevant. And so as profound, as deep, as thoughtful as you may be, if it's not entertaining, you will lose your audience. And I always say entertaining doesn't mean funny, although many times it does. You know, I have stories that that don't include any laughs whatsoever. They're very difficult stories to hear. But entertainment can be suspense and surprise and stakes and entertaining could just be like today when I talked to my students about the Panama Canal, which none of them had ever heard of. And I talked about the building of the Panama Canal. It's entertaining to discover that there's a giant canal that cuts through a country and joins two oceans. And if you tell it well enough, just the mere fact of discovering something that you did not know before can be deeply entertaining. But I'm always, when I talk about craft, I I say, if it's not entertaining, you're not ready to tell it. So that's critical. And I think For me, when I was a kid, I didn't get a lot of attention from parents and other people, we'll say. And so, you know, I think what started for me was the understanding or the discovery that when I shared stories with other people, they looked in my direction. And so few people were sort of looking in my direction that I discovered a power in that. And then I discovered that if I share my stupidity and my ridiculousness, they look even closer at me. And if I talk about things that I've done well, they don't look as closely at me as I wanted them to. And so I learned that at a very young age. And I became the person who, you know, in one of, in the words of one of my friends, actually my, my lyricist, he says, I live out loud. So, you know, I became as a kid, someone who just shared everything because I discovered that the more I shared, the more people looked in my direction and gave me the attention that I so desired. And, you know, lots of the craft that I think I intrinsically possessed when I started writing novels and taking stages. I think it all started when I was a kid. I was also deeply invested in movies early on for some reason. You know, when I was 10, I wrote to Steven Spielberg and told him the flaws in E.T. and why they should be corrected. You know, and and for years I thought he didn't respond to me until it just occurred to me like five years ago, my mother never sent that letter because in 1981, there's no internet. There's no way you can find Steven Spielberg. And my mother wasn't exactly someone who was like, championing my cause you know back then so but I was always paying attention to movies for some reason and and books and I think maybe because I was a little lonely and movies and books were ways that I could 
find company when I when I didn't have it otherwise. So all of that sort of fermented and became what you know I eventually was when I when I started telling stories out loud. But I understood that if I'm not entertaining, people won't pay attention to me. And so many of the strategies that I teach, much of the craft that I teach, is designed to teach people how to engage and hold an audience's attention and to keep them moving emotionally so that a story doesn't run one, you know, run one flat emotion all the way through, all of those kinds of things. But even with song, I agree that if you don't hook me with your song, I will not listen to your song twice. And I believe the goal of every songwriter and any, any musician is for me to fall in love with the song and to not be able to stop listening to it. And if that's your goal, I would hope there was some craft behind it because I, I suspect that all the songs that I love in the world were, you know, designed in such a way. And, and I love listening to songwriters. You know, I Tom Petty has a great line about how someone asked him, how do you... um how do you write great songs? And he says, get to the chorus as quick as you can, you know? And I thought, yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me, right? Because we get hooked on choruses, you know, we'll listen to the lyrics eventually, but it's the chorus that we're going to first fall in love with, you know, in the same way I first fell in love with my wife when she walked in the room and I said, who is that person, right? Eventually I would discover all the beautiful nuance of who she is, but initially I fell in love with the chorus, which for her was her beauty, right? So um, I think craft is really important, and I'm, I'm I'm actually surprised to hear that people push back on it. I think we'll come back to songs and, and crafts um, around songwriting a little bit more later. But just the thing with E.T., because um, it's such a beautiful story, the idea of a 10-year-old version of you being outraged by, you know, the flaws in the in the storytelling. And, and we can talk about what makes great storytelling, but I'm really curious to know what was your instinct around what makes a not so great story? Like, what did you notice then as a child? What was your instinct that said this isn't working? And how have you used that information and built on that that instinct, you know, as you've gotten better at the craft of storytelling? I'm going to combine two things here in a really beautiful way. I, <laughs> yeah, I just thought of two examples. So in E.T., the problem I had was there's a scene in the movie where uh, Elliot is connected to E.T., and E.T. is drinking beer at home, and Elliot's at school. And it's the day they're going to dissect frogs. And as a 10-year-old, I recognized the stupidity of this scene. First, the kids were going to be asked to kill the frog themselves. So they were going to put, put the glass over the frog and put in some chemical that would kill the frog, which would never happen in school. I recognized that right away, so that's stupid. And then there were way too many frogs in the room. And all the frogs sort of escaped the classroom by the end of the episode. And as a kid, I just understood... None of this is real. And in this story, you've given me an alien. That's the, like the one unreal thing you get is the alien. But everything else in the story has to be real. Otherwise, it's an alien in a ridiculous scene. And it's like a hat on a hat. And I knew that didn't work. Like I just knew that didn't make any sense. And so I wrote and complained about that particular scene. The way I use it today is... You know, in a couple nights, I'm going to be in Boston telling a story at a Moth Grand Slam. And it's about my kids getting stuck in a tube in a McDonald's play place. It's actually about my son getting stuck in the tube and I can't get him out because it's not made for adults. I can't actually fit into the tube. He's he's like two years old and he's he won't come down and he's crying and I don't know what to... Yeah. And my daughter's there. She's five or six at the time, but she won't go into the tubes because I didn't know at the time, but she has autism and, you know, she doesn't have it to the degree that you would even know it if you met her initially, but she did and tubes are too high and they're too bright and too loud for her. And so um, eventually I convince her to go up and save your, save your brother. And, and then they both get stuck up there sort of for a minute. And uh, my daughter reaches across to Charlie. There's a net that he won't cross. You know, he's already crossed it once, but he won't come back across it because he's two and he's a boy. Uh, so my daughter reaches across and I'm watching and she says to Charlie, she says, Charlie, whisper the name of the person you love most and that will give you courage. And that comes out of the mouth of a six-year-old. And it's not something I had ever said and something her, my wife had ever said. She picked it up somewhere or it came out of her brain. But either way, I'll never forget the moment. I'm going to tell that story on Tuesday night at the Grand Slam. Now, a couple things in that story that I'm going to leave out, it's Father's Day. So for me, it's a much more impactful moment because it's Father's Day. Now, I'm going to leave that out of the story, though, because I just feel like that's a hat on a hat. We don't need to know it's Father's Day. That's too much. Also, bizarrely, that same morning and about half an hour before... I got a phone call discovering that the father of one of my former students had passed away the day before. And so I've got the death of a man who I knew well, 
whose children I had in my heart on Father's Day when I experienced this moment between my children. As a storyteller, I have to ask myself, what am I really trying to say? I'm trying to say that I'm worried about my daughter because she lives in a world that she seems afraid of all the time. And I think I'm going to have to stay with her longer than I should. And I'm going to have to protect her longer than I should. And then I see her do this amazing thing. And it occurs to me, maybe she's going to be okay after all. Like she's not going to navigate the world the way everyone else does, but she seems to be doing pretty good today. Do I need to include the death of a man whose children I taught to convey that message? I don't. In fact, it's too much of a hat on a hat. It's it's frogs in a science classroom, right? In a movie with an alien. And do I need to mention that it's Father's Day? I don't. That's the one I might like, I might go back and forth on a little bit, but in the end, does it help the story? It doesn't. I think it just sort of clouds the story. It almost makes it feel unrealistic almost. You know, I worry sometimes that something happens and Right. Yeah. It almost feels like that didn't happen on Father's Day. Now, I know it did and I know all those other things happened, but my audience might not want to hear that or might not believe it. And so that's how I take that moment from E.T. where I'm like, that's ridiculous. And I say to myself, stories can't contain so much that it doesn't feel like it's real anymore, even though moments in our lives exist that kind of feel like that could not really happen, except it did happen. So I'm always careful in thinking about how is the audience receiving my story and what do they need to have versus what actually happened. A lot of us would be forgiven, however, for, you know, wanting to give more context, more background, raise the stakes. It feels like you're saying that even if it was true, you are deliberately cutting away anything that doesn't help you directly, you know, communicate that one story. Yeah, I'm trying to say one thing. A story can be only about one thing I tell people. It's like in the NFL, Football, they say if you have two quarterbacks, you don't have a quarterback. In storytelling, it's the same thing. If you're trying to say two things, you're really saying nothing because people are going to walk away wondering what you were saying. And so I'm just trying to say my daughter is more capable than I ever gave her credit for. That's what I'm trying to tell an audience is I was worried about her and now I'm a little less worried about her. That's all I want to say. And so everything in my story has to lead to that singular moment at the end. And anything that does not serve that moment goes away and does not appear in my story. Well, it's exactly the same message that we need to give to songwriting students who often, you know, will just pack a song with everything as if this one song needs to capture every single like thought or experience they've had about heartbreak or something like that. And one of the things that I always say is like exactly that, like a song is about one thing. And, and it's interesting when I sort of read and hear you speaking, Matt, about like the five second moment, I'm like, well, a song is actually maybe just the three seconds inside that five second moment. It's like, it's just the moment with none of the, like, or like the sort of stuff that has to come into it just has to so directly serve that moment. And um, in listening to your conversation with Brian Funk, who is a, a sort of nice connection there, uh, you know, you and Brian were even talking about details, like specific words or images um, and how particularly in song, which is, you know, three and a half minutes at best these days, often 24 lines of lyric, you know, eight of which will repeat themselves. You know, it's like, I always say, you know, we have very limited real estate upon which to build mansions in the minds of listeners. So we need to employ economy of language. And, um, you know, I often use an an exercise that's called sense writing with people that's kind of a sense-based free writing to get them to really describe uh, it, it's essentially an exercise in showing rather than telling, but I always have to put this caveat on it, which is like sense writing is not an excuse to ornament your language with adjectives and adverbs. It's about let it better language, not more language. You know, and this idea that like every detail has to only has to serve that core concept, that hook, that title, that central idea. And, and if it doesn't, if there's a line that is just like warming up, you know, like that actually has to go in the end, you know, like every line in a song, you should be able to black out every other line and there should be a clear connection between that line and the chorus, like a direct pathway. And if there's not, that line probably is serving some other idea or like got you there in the end. But um, I'm interested, you, you know, when you were talking about that, that idea of extraneous details that um, children are generally taught poor storytelling technique they're taught to include superfluous details that have nothing to do with storytelling and I'm just interested if if you have exercises with 
kids or adults to train them differently in that regard, like the specifics of the language that they're using and choosing in their stories. Yeah, well, I teach people that, you know, I always prefer a noun that has adjectives already attached to it. So I avoid adjectives whenever possible. Every time you put an adjective into a story, what you're asking the audience to do is to hold on to that, presumably because it's important. So eye color is the worst one of all. Everyone wants to tell me the color of the eyes of the woman they fell in love with. But when you tell me her eyes are green, what you're really telling me is her eyes are green and that's relevant to the story, so don't forget it. And in the end, it's never relevant to the story. And now you've just occupied some of my bandwidth maintaining the green eye color of this woman, whereas a much better thing to say would have been, she's the most beautiful woman I ever saw. Because what I will do in that case is I will put into your story the most beautiful woman I ever saw. And I will see her with more completeness than I will see any woman that you attempt to construct with adjectives, right? So I like to rely on the imagination of my audience. So I give them the word kitchen and nothing else. And they're going to put me in their kitchen or their parents' kitchen or a kitchen from a television show. And that's great because they see it more clearly than I could ever construct that kitchen with my words. Now, if some particularity of that kitchen is relevant to the story, I will mention that particularity, right? If someday a girl's eye color is relevant to a story, I will mention her eye color. But if it isn't relevant, I will instead lean into the audience's imagination and choose those nouns that are especially useful to me. And I will choose adjectives only when they do something for the story. Someone just was telling me a story and he mentioned that the car was red. And he said, I know you hate adjectives. Is that okay? And I said, well, it's a story about you chasing someone in a car. And red is a great color for that car to have been because it's a story about speed. So yes, red is great. If it had been pink, I would have said no way because that's just going to distract me the entire time. But a lot of people would say, I know, but it was pink. Can you believe it? And I would say, that is the kind of thing you tell your friends, but not the kind of thing you do to entertain an audience. Again, so often, I think the struggle people have is they say what they want to say instead of what the audience wants to hear. And those two things are so different. You know, what I tell my wife, you know, in regards to a story, something that happens to me is never going to be the same as what I tell on stage because my wife gets to hear everything. And even if she doesn't want to hear everything, she's still going to have to hear everything because because she's my wife. But my audience is not my spouse. My audience wants to hear a clear line from beginning to end that says something moving and meaningful. And maybe they have some some feelings along the way and maybe they laugh and cry and all of those things. They gasp and surprise. That's what they want. So we have to really be thinking about this is not really about me. It is a mixture of me and the audience. And I they're not here right now. So I have to think about them at all times and what they would want from me. Mm. It feels like the, the, the common thread here is deletion. Um, you had all of these details you could tell about your children getting stuck in the in the tube. But you have to delete the ones that are going to be distracting. Again, this idea of hair color, eye color, height, we could put it in there and we often see it put in there for more color for more context, but deletion actually becomes the thing that enhances the story. And I, I'm I'm so intrigued by now knowing this, reading uh, the Goosebumps books, R.L. Stein, because I'm reading them for my six-year-old. Man, every character that gets introduced, you you find out what they're wearing, how tall they are, <laughs> what their eye color is. And it's, it's interesting that, you know, I'm sure it's there for a particular age group, and yet my son doesn't seem to care about anything other than when the mummies come out of the pyramid and start chasing them. You know, the action, he's just waiting for the action part. I tell people, no one has ever sat down and said, boy, I hope there's a lot of description in this story. And no one's ever finished a book and thought, boy, I wish they had described more stuff. You know, people want to know what was said, what you did, and what you thought, and what you felt. That's what they want. And any description that gets put in there should just be serving those purposes. They should be helping you do those four things. And otherwise, it's all irrelevant, and it, it's not fun, it's not entertaining, and it draws from bandwidth that could be used in other places. So anyone who's trying to elevate their storytelling, whether it be, you know, being a novelist, a songwriter in whatever format, would you recommend this idea of writing down all of the stuff that happened, all of the description, and then really going through and deleting a lot of detail, a lot of, a lot of extraneous detail? I wouldn't even recommend writing it down because I fear that when people put things on pages, they fall in love with them. And, you know, it's killing your darlings. Like, don't even give birth to your darlings and you don't have to kill them. So I say, tell the story 
with as little detail as possible with the thought of maybe I will get to add some detail at the end if I discover it's relevant to the story. So tell the bare bones skeletal version of your story first. When I teach people to tell stories, oftentimes we create a skeleton. We say, here's the seven scenes and here's the things that are essential to each one of those scenes and here's how they're going to connect. And then I say, okay, now you have to go put words to it. And they always think like, well, that's the hard part. And I say, well, it's kind of the hard part, but you have a roadmap now, you know, and even if you don't say it in a pretty way or a a smart way or a clever way, you're still going to say it. And that's great. It's why, you know, as a woman in New York City, Danusha, she's, uh, I think English is her third language, like Polish, Russian, and then English. So her vocabulary is not nearly as extensive as mine. Her nouns and verbs don't always agree. She speaks with an accent, still kicks my butt sometimes in storytelling, right? Because it doesn't matter your familiarity or your expertise with the language is irrelevant. I always say storytelling is about decision making. It is what you have chosen to say, when you choose to say it, how you choose to frame it, you know, what you're leading towards. All of those things are so important. And if you turn a great phrase, that's great. But that's not why people sit down and listen. They're not hoping to hear the turn of a great phrase. They want to hear vulnerability, truth, you know, honesty, humor, surprise, suspense. Those are the things they want to hear. Mm. Um, I want to turn quickly in the sort of 10 minutes at the end here to your new book, which I took great pleasure in listening to the audiobook version um, on 1.5 speed, which is always then funny when you go back to one speed and it sounds like you're like speaking very slowly, which is um, delightful. Um, <laughs> but it was so nice to hear you narrate that book and... Um, the book is Some Day Is Today, and it's really about uh, productivity for people doing creative work. Um, and there's a particular quote that I just loved, Matt, and um, hopefully this quote will kind of help talk about one of the most important things, ideas that I feel like you were trying to convey in that book. So here's the quote. If you want to make your dreams come true, a concrete meridian with a struggling leafless sapling makes a perfect place to write a couple of pages before having your teeth cleaned. Any place that has a reasonable amount of oxygen and terrestrial gravity works just fine. People who wait for the ideal circumstance in order to create usually die before their dreams are ever realized. I'm interested if you can talk about that particular concrete meridian and really the the idea that you're trying to convey with that story. I kind of love that. That was great. Thanks. Uh, well, I remember the day well. Uh, I was going to get my teeth cleaned. It was during the pandemic, so it was one of those you can't sit in the waiting room, you know, you wait in your car and we'll call you or, you know, something like that. I had time and I, I was working on a book and it was too hot to sit in the car and work on the book. So I said, well, I'm going to find a bench and there were no benches. And uh, it was a Whole Foods parking lot with a dentist office on the side. And there was a concrete, you know, one of those little islands in the middle of the in the middle of the parking lot and had a little sapling with a little shade. And so I went out to the sapling and I leaned up against the sapling and I had, you know, my computer there and I just, I started working and someone walked by a friend of mine, actually, actually was the mother of one of my former students. And she saw me and she said, are you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm just, I'm working on a book. I'm waiting to get my teeth cleaned. And she said, why are you sitting here? And I said, well, I don't really need much to do work. Like, you know, (laughs) so many people that I work with in the realm of productivity, they just treat the craft as so damn precious. You know, I've met actual human beings who have said to me, you know, I can only work between 10 and 2. And I really, I need light jazz and a Starbucks and a cappuccino and, you know, all of this nonsense. And all I do is I tell them that in World War I, there were men in trenches Bombs were exploding over their head. They were wearing gas masks and they were scribbling things in notebooks, hoping that if they survived the battle, maybe someday something they wrote would be seen by other human beings. And so if you need a Starbucks and you can only work from 10 to 2, you're not really doing the work. What you really want to do is to have done the work or to be seen doing the work. But the work can be done anywhere and it should be done anywhere and it doesn't matter space or time or even device, you know, whatever it takes to make stuff. If you want to make stuff, if you want to be a musician or a writer or a storyteller or anything, a gardener, or a, you know, a maker of lemonade stands in your town, whatever you want to do, you either really want to do it and you'll do it relentlessly whenever you have an opportunity 
or you will treat it as some precious bauble that um, will yield nothing in the end. So I'm just sort of relentless in the idea that you should just be doing work whenever you can. This amazing uh, idea around time or your relationship with time and the way you express this in, in some of your work is, is fan, uh, fascinating. The idea that, you know, all minutes are really, you know, they're all usable in the same way. And yet it is our own kind of belief that the 10 minutes you're waiting before you leave the house to go somewhere is not as usable a 10 minutes as the 10 minutes that you've sat down and dedicated to work. And, and I loved in particular this idea that you have like a list of 10 minute activities as a way of saying, right, well, if I do have 10 minutes, I'm going to pull out. It, it's almost like you have taken this idea of productivity and made it so radically practical by giving yourself support with these tools and these prompts so that, you know, you're never really. Yeah, my production manager who read my book for me, proofread it, she said the biggest shift in her life has been she used to think about time in terms of 15, 30, and 60-minute blocks. And if she didn't have one of those blocks, she felt like it couldn't be used. And those minutes were just thrown away. And that's what happens. Today, it's terrible because if you have five minutes to kill, right? First of all, that phrase is just terrible, right? Because I'll tell you, having been at what I thought was going to be the end of my life, five minutes would have been the most precious thing I had, could have ever asked for, right? So if you're killing five minutes, you have no idea what life will actually feel like near the end. So stop killing time. But those five minutes, you're right, they're just as precious as anything else we have if we choose to use them in a meaningful way. And when we talk about productivity, I always like to remind people, for me, productivity could mean I'm going to go outside and throw a baseball with my son, Charlie. Or I'm going to sit down and have a meaningful conversation about the movie we just watched with my daughter. That's Those are 10-minute activities, along with the book that's positioned by the door. So if everyone's looking for their shoes, except for me, because I know where to put my shoes when I take them off so I can find them again so I don't waste minutes, there's a book by the door. Right now, it's Groucho Marx's Letters, a collection of Groucho Marx letters, which are perfect for 10 minutes, because you can read three letters. You don't have to like hold a place in a story, right? So I, I find ways to use that time. People throw it away like it's meaningless. And today, all they do is they look at their phone. And when you look at your phone, invariably, you end up feeling worse about yourself by the time you're done looking at it anyway. So we fill our time with things that make us feel bad rather than filling our time with something that makes us feel good or makes us feel excellent about the way we spent the time. So there's 1,440 minutes in a day. And that is a better number to be thinking of than 24 hours in a day because those minutes, they count and they pile up re relentlessly if you use them properly. How do you integrate into your creative practice, Matt? The, like, have you heard the kind of neuroscience talking heads, people these days talking about like the default network, like the importance of this brain state that is kind of this, um, it's almost like the thing that would be like staring out of a train window, right? Like it's, they, it's neuroscience is kind of discovering that there's this like default network in the brain that's a really different series of processes and synapses and stuff that happens in this kind of it's like it, it's not a quite it's sort of a passive state but it doesn't have to be completely passive um but a lot of the research is like suggesting that it's an essential brain state for creativity and actually allows connections to happen but not in a it, it's like to me the way i experience it and think of it when i'm reading or listening to people talk about it is it's it's the flip side of problem solving right like there's like a problem solving state or a deliberate like um knowledge acquisition input and this state is a much more like sitting back <laughs> and like just letting the connections happen in an unstructured way that appears to be like an essential part of the creative process and i'm interested how if and how that works for you in your flow and whether that is something you scheduling can it be something you schedule in? i'm just interested in like how that works for you right i you know i think the the ways i use it or the ways i find those times and i believe in them you're right it's why we find our best ideas in the shower right because there's nothing to distract us and the water and the sound and all of that so you know for me exercise every day is definitely a time where my mind just tends to wander i ride a bike um you know every single day and and taking showers and driving a car actually is pretty passive for me. So that's one of those times when I can do that as well. But, you know, part of it is writing too. You know, I was teaching a workshop a few years ago at a, at an all girls school. And uh, I, 
I was sending the girls off to go do some writing. And one of the girls came up to me, a high school girl, and she said, is it okay if I just think for a little bit before I write? And I said, yeah, I do that all the time. Sometimes a writing session for me is 45 minutes of staring at the wall and trying to figure out what I want to say next, right? And she told me that her teacher doesn't let her do that, that she has to think at the end of her pen. And I said, what the hell does that mean? And she said, if I'm thinking, I have to be writing what I'm thinking. That's what I'm told to do. And I thought, that is a person who doesn't write. Like, that's a person who doesn't understand what the creative process is. You know, it's a, that's disastrous. Mm -hmm. And so I spend a lot of time in that state where I will tell my wife I spent an hour and a half writing today. But, you know, 20 minutes of that might have been literally staring out the window, just thinking what the hell is supposed to happen next in this story. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think there's value in that. And uh, I think it's sort of that process of me sitting in the car after that golf round and saying to myself, why do you do the things that you do? And just, I remember what I was staring at while I was trying to figure out what was I doing, you know? And that's almost that similar type of state where I'm just going to let myself sit with something and see if, you know, something bubbles up from beneath, which it did that day. So yeah, I think there's enormous value in that. I probably mm -hmm. don't do it enough. Mm -hmm. You know, I probably, I'm probably not doing it enough, but then again, I'm not at a lack of ideas, you know, and I'm not, you know, as people tell me, my wife says, you know, people worry that I don't sleep enough. You know, there's a whole chapter on sleep. And I tell people I sleep somewhere between five and a half to six and a half hours a night. And some people say it's not enough. And I always say, have you ever seen me tired or unfocused, right? Have you ever noticed that I'm dragging? And I'm, I, I just, it's not me. So, you know, I'm like, I could sleep eight hours, but I seem to be doing great on five and a half right now or six. And so um, I think it's the same way with, with what you've described, which is mm -hmm. to say, if I was lost for ideas, maybe I would be doing more of that. But right mm -hmm. now I'm sort of not as lost for ideas. Um, I don't want to take too much more of your time, Matt. I've got um, maybe just one more question to ask you. And, and normally, I, normally I would ask, is there anything that you had wished I had asked? But because I have read your books, I actually know exactly the question to ask you because you told me in your book, which the, yes, you said in your, in your, in some days today, you said everyone should always ask these two questions. And the last question you said is, what is the hardest thing that you have recently faced professionally? Oh, that's a great question. I don't remember writing that, but I completely agree with it. I think that's fantastic. What's the hardest thing that I have faced professionally recently you said the two questions you said is like if you if you have a chance to talk to your heroes you know people whose careers and lives you, you you admire and that you want to emulate like the first question you should ask them is like how did you get to where you are today like what did you do to become the thing you wanted to become and then the other question is like what is the hardest thing that you recently faced professionally well i guess the hardest thing is something i'm still facing right now i had a broadway director sort of become aware of me and you know reached out and said hey send me a clip of your work I'd love to see it I've heard you do good stuff and because I'm not just going to send them any random clip of my work I found a theater a sort of very professional theater here in Connecticut and I booked it and I'm doing a solo show with uh, a camera crew and we're going to turn it into a special like an hour and 15 minute special and I have to put together an hour and 15 minute special in the next sort of 70 days. And I'm feeling the weight of that situation right now, you know? Mm. And, and if I wasn't sort of planning on sending it to this person, and if I hadn't filled the theater with, you know, 280 people for two nights, and if I hadn't sort of set expectations in the way I did, I wouldn't be worried about it at all. But, you know, I don't often feel the weight of expectation. I often feel like I got this, it's no problem. But this one's, I've sort of ventured into a land that I've never sort of stepped into before. And so I'm feeling a little bit of that, a little bit of that, um, that uncharted territory, I guess a little bit. So I'm working hard at that. And because I don't write anything down, I, I don't write anything down, I say on a stage, that means now I'm, I'm holding on an hour and 15 minutes in my head you know, which is also slightly challenging. So I'm doing a lot of that in the midst of writing a book. So mm -hmm. that is also due at the end of the summer. So I've sort of saddled myself with a couple of big projects. And I think 
I think it's the un the the uncharted ground that I've mm -hmm. sort of placed myself in. But I think that's important. You know, I never wanted to do stand up because I always thought that sounds awful. You like you have to be funny. I can be funny in storytelling, and if I'm not funny, I'm still telling a story. Nobody cares. And that's why I went and did stand up for the first time because I recognized I was afraid of it. Mm -hmm. And if you're afraid of it, you should run at it as hard as you can. And so that's what I chose to do. And it was not, it, I didn't run at it and go, yeah, I ran at it and said, what the hell are you thinking? And it's worked out beautifully. You know, it's worked out really well, but you know, if I had just stayed away, cause I was afraid that would have been, um, that would have been one of those moments where you're a hundred years old and you look back and go, boy, I really blew that. I had a chance to be funny on stages and do stand up, and I didn't do it. And now I'm a hundred and I can't get over there anymore. Nobody wants to hear from me. So so run at things that you're afraid of. And I guess this one I was a little afraid of, but I'm, I'm going to be happy that I have done it. So just as a final question on that idea of getting to 100 and looking back on your life, given that you have done so many things, is there anything you haven't done that you are really looking forward to tackling in the future? <laughs> um, I mean, I'm always looking for the next thing. You know, I'm always looking for the next challenge. I. I guess I don't feel like I've done a lot, I guess, you know, it's weird. There's a shelf of books behind me and I wrote all those books and, you know, my wife is like, look at all the books you wrote and I have two more coming out, you know, and, and the stories and all of the stuff. I always feel like I'm only as good as like my next thing. So I'm always tackling the next thing, but I'm also, I really am focused on the idea that we should be trying to do new things all the time. So I fell into a rabbit hole. I was looking for, um, I want to figure out if a, if a plane situation in a movie could have really happened. I don't remember actually what the movie was, but I saw a movie and I was like, do planes really do that? And I said, well, the internet will tell me. So I went to a YouTube channel and the guy de deconstructed the scene beautifully. And I was like, I like this guy. And then it, led me to, oh, there's another movie with another plane. I've seen that one. And pretty soon I was studying aviation in a really deep and fundamental way. And I was watching, I learned how to like watch plane landings to figure out if the pilot did it right or wrong. And I could, it, it you know, my wife didn't know about it for a while. She's like, what are you doing? And I said, I'm studying aviation. That's my new thing. And I didn't have any purpose for it whatsoever. Other than I was just, it was my, I always think you should have the next thing that you're doing. And then last summer, my wife bought me flying lessons. I went and flew a plane for the first time. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think I wanted to do it. I thought it was going to be terrifying. It, it was a 1977 Cessna. I'm like, this plane is almost as old as me, you know, and, and these planes are tiny. And like, you know, he was like, pull on the door hard because it wiggles. And if you don't pull it on hard, it'll fly open. And I was like, this is not what flying should be. And he's like, this is what flying is. And I flew the plane most of the time. I actually, he let me land it and everything. And I loved it. I don't know wow. if I'm ever going to actually fly another plane. I don't know if it's in my heart. I loved being up there, but I wasn't like I had to get up there again. But that was my next thing. You know, mm -hmm. that was the next thing. And I'm sort of still in it. And my son just found a flight simulator. So he's been simulating actual plane flight. And he's talking about airlines and elevators. And he's sort of become obsessed with it, weirdly, just separately from me. And now we talk mm -hmm. about it together. So right now it's aviation. But I'm, I feel like I'm moving beyond it and looking for the next thing. But, you know, what I tell people is it doesn't have to necessarily be the thing that's going to make you productive. You know, mm -hmm. I I got involved in investing about 10 years ago, and I'm a, I'm a serious investor these days. I had no idea, though, when I got involved with investing, that the understanding that I have about companies in this country, every single day when I'm working with a corporate client, I am able to talk about finance and business in a way I never would have been able to. 10 years ago. And so many of my clients say, it's amazing how many companies you're able to talk about with such fluency. And it wasn't because I was thinking 10 years ago, this is going to help me in my corporate work that I will eventually do with people. I had no idea I was going to do that. But what I just continue to do is expand my life. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I don't think any corporate person's ever going to ask me about aviation. I don't think aviation is going to help me on a storytelling stage. I don't think I'm ever going to write a novel about aviation. But I just say to myself, I'm going to take this new thing in. I'm going to learn as much as I want to learn, and then I will move on to the next thing. So that's what I think everyone should be doing is just be a lifelong learner and constantly look for the thing that you don't know about and, you know, make that your next thing. 